So I would like to invite uh, Ramon Alberto dos Santos. Ramon is uh, one of the experts in Brazil uh, in internet well, regulation yeah. and yeah. internet law. He is a lawyer and he is an associate uh, with Pereira Leto, huh? Pereira Neto Macedo uh, law firm as well and was part of the uh, IoT plan drafting in Brazil. Not only part, but uh, coordinated, I think, like uh, the efforts uh, for the plan as well, and a, a team and uh, devoted like a, a lot of work in doing that. So thank you so much for being with us. And we will have also Professor Marcos Troijo, uh, who's the director of the Brick Lab and also faculty here at Columbia University. And he is stuck in traffic, as I heard. And he will be here, um, I think, 2.45. That's very typical for Brazilians. The Brazilians, <laughs> they usually get stuck in traffic statistically more often than uh, other people, you know. But uh, that's great that he'll be joining us. And with that said, let me hand the floor to Professor Dasgupta, who has a presentation that he would like to share. Thank you, Professor. Well, um, I, I, I'm going to prepare you be before I start. My talk, my talk is going to be the most boring, OK? So take a deep <laughs> breath and do a little bit of yoga, OK? Because I'm an engineer, I'm not that as creative as you guys are. So uh, I would like to uh, po point one one thing that which is common in terms of planning something uh, in Brazil and, uh, and, and China. So uh, being an engineer, I thought that the natural disasters is something that we have to plan at a uh, very high level. Uh, it is not very well understood you know, what it is all about. So I will go through some of the mundane thing. OK, here is some equation that I'm showing you just to scare you. <laughs> the idea that what I have, I have perceived that most of the policy people, they use wrong technical terms. Like most of the people, they say statistics. What is statistics? This is not statistics. This is something different. This is statistics of extremes, not the average statistics. It is not your bell curve. I mean, it is mean not the common uh, rainfall, OK? For common rainfall, your tool is an umbrella. But for a flood, umbrella is not going to work, correct? So this is just like that. So secondly, also a lot of time we hear this word security. In, in uh, Latin uh, languages, you don't have two words, security, you know, and that is also been safety. But here we understand. If the, my, mm, uh, my bank is robbed, I call, uh, it's a you know, safety deposit vault. But if Wall Street collapses, we call it security. So these are of two different levels. And I would like to draw your attention to the other part, what we call extreme natural disasters, which is different from other things. Like the same thing with smart cities. Smart cities are for dumb people. How about intelligent city? Meaning that what do you do with the traffic when 9-11 happens? OK, so that is the kind of problems that I would like to do. And just again, there are three kinds of uh, equations and other things. But the last one that we call normal distribution gives you the bell shaped curve. But there are three different kinds of uh, statistics for natural, industrial, and terrorist disasters. We can prove it by mathematics. OK, you don't have to be proved by mathematics because it's a dangerous tool. Uh, mathematics proved that any constitution you write could be overthrown by fascism. Doesn't matter what constitution is that, okay? There's a mathematical proof for that. So I will, I will try to be, bring you the other way. So what happens, the, in, I, we are working on the 2020 Olympics, and I took the same building that in uh, Japan they rebuilt it, where they rebuilt it to highlight rescue and evacuation. There are signs like exit, right? When uh, extreme disaster happens, it might be better to jump through the window than go there if the fire is there. So that is the kind of safety that people talk about. OK, I'm not interested in that. I'm talking about extreme security things. So here comes on how do we commonly evaluate what the progress is, OK? So this is our model. And we say that, look, let us see whether the nutrition level has increased. I don't care how many Mercedes-Benz they drive, where the sanitation has 
been improved. By sanitation, I mean air, water, and the, uh, and the land. So we, these are all measurable things. And there, we can check the uh, climate change to be a barometer. So these things are very well measurable. And then we have education and recreation, what we say, can be measured by the freedom of expression. And you guys uh, are specialists in that. So if, as an engineer, my job is to f mainly to do the sanitation part, being a civil engineer, but I will say that nutrition, sanitation are also, changed with, are also linked with climate change. And just to go back, that all these medical plans and other things are very good, but if we can elevate the nutrition and sanitation quality, okay, we have maybe put many of the big uh, medical uh, insurance farms out of business. Okay, so, so that is the kind of things we can do and we can measure. And I think Brazil and uh, China, they have the similar kind of problems. I'm very impressed that how many Mercedes-Benz I see today in China. First, my first visit was in 83. In Shanghai, there was only one car. Maybe people ate better, I don't know. So these are things, okay. So here I would like to make one point, what is safety and what is security? In English, it makes, uh, very important distinction. As I said, in Latin languages, it doesn't. So you call it extreme security, I think. So by security, we mean something where the collapses, like 9-11, okay? Uh, Katrina, BP oil spill, those are the things. And I must, uh, I must credit this to a Columbia professor called Gumbel, who in 1950s was a professor in engineering school, and the book is written by Gumbel on that natural disaster things. So that's where we go. Now, how do we do that? So here is some uh, mathematical jargon, but computer has become a tool to do mathematics. That's why I look at it. Okay. So here is a, a, a picture that I would like to uh, go over, that here there is a data collection system, and there's a policy system. So we digitize the policy using fuzzy logic, which also came from Colombia by Professor Zadeh. So he has a way to say computing with words. And Professor Zadeh did the fuzzy logic so that we can digitize the policy. So now those policies are integrated with the incoming data, and then we make different kind of decision. We make a decision based on what kind of things we are looking at. For example, terrorists are going to uh, inflict largest amount of harm. So they are watching what you're doing. So it's a game theory problem. And we were very fortunate to work with Professor Nash on that. So finally, all these things comes out and it goes to a broadcast. So Millions and millions of data, uh, of gigabyte data is condensed to what to do. What do I run to save my life? So that is the kind of compression I'm saying. And we are very happy to work with the linguistics people who, try to, uh, who are teaching us how the grammar can really compress data. Because final thing, we do not need the junk of one, two, zero, those numbers. We need a fact. So data is, in my mind, nonsense. From there, you extract the information. And from there, from there, you extract the decision which pertains to the point at that time. Now, if you transmit that, then you are talking on a very robust, intelligent system. So that was the kind of things we were talking about. So here, we will get, get back again to natural disaster, because I should not talk about philosophy. I'm not a philosopher. So here are the things to, uh, to talk about. And these are the things that I took from the internet. And of course, Brazil. And, and China, if you ask me what we should do in terms of development, I don't know. I will say, look, save the people from natural disaster, which can be done. And that is also related to climate change. Okay? Uh, if I don't say, I'll be lying. And there, both Brazil and, and China, they are together. Okay? I am also there. Okay? So now, United Nations has this conference on this uh, uh, disaster reduction, but those are planning things, okay? I'm talking about the engineering idea. So again, going back to so working with some engineers in, in Japan, okay, there are engineering methods available to predict landslides. 
So we have to include that when we go to the climate conference saying that, look, we are talking about extreme statistics, extreme disasters, and we know how to simulate those things. Okay? So one of the words that people talk about resilience, what is that? Okay, being an engineer, whenever I hear something, I would like to quantify that. So, again, to scare you. So, we understand one thing, the severity of a natural disaster is what? How many years it takes to occur, right? That we call return period. Everybody understands that except our politicians, I guess, or the people, who, academics who present in, uh, in, uh, in Paris. 15 years disaster, we understand. 50 years disaster, we understand. And definitely 50 years disasters are more disastrous than 15 years, right? And in Brazil, it's happening. The forest fires, which were 15 years disasters, are happening in five years. What does that tell you? Okay? I, I'm, I'm not making any judgment. I'm just giving you, you know, very raw data, not big data, small data. So the thing is that if, if it takes... T 15 years to uh, have that disaster and one year to recover, then I say that your resilience is 15. If it takes two years to recover, your resilience is 7.5. Basically what I'm saying, that your resilience is proportional to the return period and inversely proportional to the recovery period. Very simple thing. But that mathematics is not that simple. And uh, there is also one technical part that we have to talk about, agility. So preparedness is something that we can exercise. And we have done that in, in, uh, in, uh, to in uh, not in Tokyo, in Kawata. The places they have done that, they have implemented it. Very simple thing, when the flood came, they went and recovered the elderly people. Now, you don't need a genius, right? But they uh, reduced the number of casualties tremendously from these agility things. Okay, so now where do we come? Again, I come back to the four points that I talk about. In nutrition, sanitation, those are the two things, our contradiction with the physical world. We cannot avoid that. And then I talk education and creation, that is our human mind. So those four things constitute four color problem. And four color problem is a fascinating problem in mathematics. Meaning that you need only four colors to draw the picture of the world, right? So the two oh, countries will not have same color. But we have this uh, friend of ours, uh, sorry, uh, who does these things, and this is called a chain. So these are different beats of four colors to generate, to simulate disaster. Meaning that once you have the model, you can test where it is going to fail. So the intelligent city will tell you where it is not going to work, where your smart city is not going to work. So we are on that fringe. Okay? So again, going back, I think this kind of summarizes what we as engineers can do. We can f do everything to uh, promote nutrition, sanitation, education, and what I call recreation, because human mind is very important. And in Brazil, recreation, I think, is more important than anything else. <laughs> okay. So with that, I thank you. My pleasure. And Dean, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let's move to Hamo. I'm not sure if you have a presentation of yourself. That's good. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to join the Brazilian crowd with no PowerPoint. That's great. Uh, and rare. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would just like to, uh, to say that you said your part was like the boring one. Now comes the boring part, because we are talking about regulation in a Because you are insulting my intelligence. Because <laughs> I will not understand, no, right? No, they no. are high-tech guys, isn't no, it? No, no, definitely not. No, no, we are stupid engineers, that's yeah. okay. No, 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 definitely not. I, I think that uh, that part is like one of, the, one of the main things that we were debating about regulation and why should we try to change some things that would not poss make possible that kind of development, I think, uh, our goal is to achieve these kinds of developments. Uh, when, we, when we say that the regulation is not good yet or we need to develop new areas of regulation, I think what we are trying to do is we need to change these social problems, these this, uh, this scenarios that for once were inevitable, but now we can change. Uh, I would like to, to uh, go forward in the presentation that Ronaldo did. Like, when we analyzed, when we did the national study on IoT in Brazil, we kind of looked abroad and saw China, we saw the European Union, we saw some efforts in the United States, and I, we can like generalize in 
what are the main challenges uh, of when we consider regulation in this new frame? And not only IoT, but uh, as Professor uh, Benjamin told, like digital and all the things that we're seeing right now. So uh, many of the topics I, I will briefly ta uh, talk to you. I have 10 minutes. It's a lot of stuff, but I'll try to, to make it uh, as fast as I can. Uh, they are not only connected to IoT. We're talking about challenges in digital in all aspects. Uh, one of the things that we can consider like one of the main points of IoT as we consider connectivity as one of the important topics, it's regulation in telecommunication services. Uh, in order for devices, uh, IoT devices to work, they need a, a, in, in some layer connectivity. And most of the part is going to be wireless connectivity. So that comes with lots of regulations. Most of the countries regulate pretty tightly the, 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 the telecommunications. So the first point that you will always see is like, we need to expand broadband access. Uh, if, we, if you don't have connectivity in, in rural areas, uh, even in, in other aspects of smart, how can you build a smart city without connectivity? So the first challenge that most of the countries are dealing with is how can we expand broadband and, and we may be talking about just public policies, or, maybe being, or as in Brazil we're talking, we may be talking about changing regulation, how we did this for all this time, now it's time to change, we need to expand this, so flexibility would be good, it would be a willing to, uh, to intensify this. Another aspect of telecommunication is, uh, most of the times when we, we see regulation in the past, Roaming was an issue that, and let's take aside the European Union, they solved this internally, but uh, internationally roaming between the uh, telecommunication devices were always an issue. When, we, when you consider that IoT devices could travel, let's just think about uh, autonomous vehicles that you're going to make this in Germany, in China, and you're going to bring them to Brazil, you need to consider the possibility of allowing different regimes of uh, roaming because if you not allow these devices, uh, if you consider like the general, the traditional regulation would be, oh, okay, you want to bring this car here, you need to have a SIM card, a Brazilian SIM card to operate. But that mindset would not work when you consider information security. If you make this vulnerable to these changes, you are putting in risk the product itself. So one of the topics we saw was roaming and we already seen some technical uh, advances that would make possible not to change regulation, like we saw the, uh, the electronic SIM cards technology where you could switch between IMSE numbers be uh, and you would not have to change the model itself. But that is a topic that the European Union, the United States, they're all debating. Uh, another one is quality of service. All the telecommunications uh, regulation that we have in place, they were thought for people-to-people -people communication. When you shift this to uh, M2M communications, you have the opportunity to flexibilize this in a sense that, okay, if your product needs a small quality of, uh, of service, then you should be able to provide that in a, in a, in a quantity that it's uh, applicable to it. But generally, in, in Brazil, we saw this. We are now uh, opening this, uh, this new way. But the regulation is strictly mandates some very high standards. So if you consider a device, and as, uh, as Contigio was mentioning, if we, we consider like these new kinds of networks that the quantity of data they're transmitting is very small, you don't need the quality of service of traditional mobile services. So quality of service is definitely one of the topics that are on the table. And another one that is, it has two uh, different ranges is identifiers. So you need to identify these devices. Uh, when we are thinking about public internet or the IP connection uh, in general, you can think about IPv4. But IPv4 is like limited to its number of uh, addresses. So we are seeing the shift to IPv6. Uh, Brazil and I think uh, China as well, we, we are seeing this moving fast, but it's still a long road ahead. But definitely this is one of the topics that you need to have when you are considering like these changes uh, to make IoT possible in the telecommunication sphere. Uh, moving, moving ahead to one of other big topics and uh, during the discussions here we've, we have already heard it a lot, uh, privacy and data protection and data in general. Uh, some countries have already developed a framework. We, are, we see Europe ahead of this with a very protective framework. In the US, you have like sectorial uh, uh, regulation as well. 
but one of the things that we are seeing in very, uh, various privacy commissioners around the world, they are, they are starting to, to, to take a look at that, is you need to, like, you may have the general rules of consent, of how do you anonymize data, but we are shifting very quickly to a, a new scenario. And if you don't have, like, specific guidelines, the industry will not be able to fulfill its, 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 its possibilities. At the same time, you may be putting consumers at risk or the privacy of this individual at risk. So there, there are countries like Brazil that where we need to have this comprehensive framework that we don't have yet. We have like a lot of uh, different rules and they generally are not comprehensively un un interpreted. Uh, but in other countries, even if you have that and, you, and if you have DPAs, the, this data protection uh, authorities, you still need to move a step further because you need to have guidelines, you need to analyze this scenario in a different way. We saw some efforts from the European Union itself. The, uh, in Canada, the Privacy Commissioner did a very comprehensive study on health, uh, health devices, on how this is starting to be used in retail. If we consider the, the debates we're talking here about uh, how these devices can be tracked over time in the retail industry, we have a lot of possibilities, but we need to make sure that that is, uh, is pretty much designed in a way to protect the consumers, to protect the privacy of individuals, and at the same time make it possible to make these new developments. Uh, in this topic, we also have one other way, but this is not related to privacy of personal data, but it's also related to data, uh, that we are seeing in the US, in the European Union, we saw this uh, as a very different uh, framework that is, beside personal data, there is a, a new debate regarding non-personal data and how can you make that work for businesses, work for innovation. Uh, one of the examples, and it was a very good one we mentioned in our study, was the, uh, the, uh, the Far American Farm Bureau uh, in the US. They developed, like in 2014, a very comprehensive uh, self-regulation standard of privacy and security in farm data. And it, it was one of the standards of the industry, and at the same time, the farmers accepted. And basically what this framework, the self-regulation framework, was trying to do is uh, we need to have some guidelines about how can you use data in specific sectors. And we're not talking about personal data. We're, these debates are very mature in some ways, but here we're talking about ownership of data and how can you use this data and even portability of data. One of the aspects of this self-regulation in the US is that farmers can have portability of their data. So if they hire Monsanto, for instance, they can, uh, after the, the service is finished, they can ask Monsanto to get their data if, if Monsanto is following this, these guidelines, I'm not uh, quite sure on that, but Monsanto <laughs> signed the, the self-regulation. Uh, but it would be a, part of, uh, a possibility for these farmers to get their data and move to another service provider. Uh, of course, in, in terms of innovation, the, the members of the industry found that this was perfect. But they, they can have the data, they can utilize it to make their service better. And at the same time, the farmers have the right to get their data and move to another provider. That, that is how you can like protect one side of the, of the equation, at the same time, make it possible for innovation to move forward. So uh, we have debates in, in data related to personal data and to non-personal data, and these are very important. In general, we are seeing personal data being heavily regulated, and we can have differences. I think mm -hmm. China is one example, the European Union, uh, the US is like debating now with, after Cambridge Analytica. Uh, but this is one aspect of the equation. The other one is how can you deal, how can you foster uh, the use of non-personal data for innovation and at the same time to make all the sides in this, uh, in this econ economy like work well. Another layer, and, and this is definitely like a tough one, and uh, as our, our previous panel uh, demonstrated, you can have like different approaches, but we need to consider it like a different, a different layer because it has some very specific challenges. It's cybersecurity. When we consider cybersecurity, we have been dealing with these challenges since the start of the information age. Since the internet started, we have been having challenges with, with cybersecurity. Uh, at the beginning, we have like these things like the end user needs to update its systems. We have patches all the time. The end user needs to focus on more things. But one of the mantras we have in information security is that if you put that much pressure on the end user, 
the outcome is going to be d disastrous because the end user not have it, it don't have all the information that it needs to uh, to protect itself from uh, vulnerabilities, zero days, and all the other challenges we have. So, one of the points we are considering right now in, when we consider IoT is that the challenges we always have with cybersecurity are going to increase exponentially. With more devices uh, having software uh, in the, uh, in, embedded in it, with more devices have connect connectivity to the public internet, the more the challenges will be. Because if you have one device with one vulnerability, we're not talking about 10, 100 devices. We're talking about 1 million, 10 million devices across multiple jurisdictions. So one of the challenges is, do we need to push forward regulation? Uh, we saw the example of China, and, and it's one of the approaches we heard in Brazil, for instance, we heard from uh, one of the government branches that is basically formed by military officers. They are very concerned about this, and they are prepared to move forward with stricter approaches. Uh, that is one of the things that we heard a lot. And when you talk with the technology uh, sector, they are very scared of that. Because at the same time, if you put so much strict regulation, you're definitely going to put a cost on the, inf on the innovation. And that may kill innovation at some point. So the equation here is very complex. You have vulnerabilities. You have like uh, some failures in basic e security protocols. One, uh, as Thomas was, uh, was, uh, was questioning in the other panel, one of the uh, most tough things we had in the last two years was those huge denial of service attacks. And most of them were made by hackers that had the ability to like uh, hack these devices. And most of them, sim the, the most, most of them, the vulnerability was admin and passwords that were weak, like uh, admin, admin, one, 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 two, three, four. <laughs> so uh, these challenges, is, uh, they increase exponentially, not because the, the challenge is new, but because the quantity of devices that could be exposed to it, it's, uh, it's massive. So I think one of the things that uh, we try to, uh, to debate in, in the study and we saw as a possibility is the, the, the private sector needs to act more on this. So self-regulation is something very important. If this could advance, we could like start to grasp some co-regulation, but uh, everything is on the table on this topic. And, and this is a challenge. We need to face it. And, Put it on the end user is definitely something tricky. The end user will not be able to deal with it. Uh, we saw with the last year, like ransomware attacks on, <coughs> on the Windows XP. Those attacks were one, just to, it, it, they resemble what could happen with IoT because Windows XP have been on, 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 uh, on these devices for years and years in medical, in, in critical infrastructure, and they were not updated. That were, that's what the, were the cause of the attacks. So you can imagine that happening with IoT devices, the same thing, and even worse. So information security is something important. And one of the things we considered in, the, in this study was you, you, may, you may not like advance regulation because that could kill innovation. But when you consider like some very strategic uh, instance, like critical infrastructure, then you have space, and even the private sector is open to it in public procurement contracts, to a more specific guideline. So, when we're talking about critical infrastructures, then it's a different approach than general public, general private devices that you can buy. Um, aside these three main topics, uh, there is some specific considerations that we saw that were very uh, complex, and we saw in, in the presentation in the last panel, and uh, we definitely have different opinions about it, but smart cities is one of the great possibilities that IoT can bring. Uh, we, uh, we, we kind of, in, in the Brazilian perspective, one of the challenges is how can you foster this in the public sector? How can you make uh, is, is small cities be able to introduce these new kind of things? How can you make possible that even in large cities that have the capacity to it, how can you make it in a comprehensive way, like securing rights, uh, making the public, uh, public, uh, the public goods more accessible in an efficient way? But one of the topics that we saw that was very, uh, we didn't have a consensus, and that's going to be for a long time, is the use of IoT devices for public security. Uh, 
uh, we saw uh, the Europeans even call uh, started with a, uh, a term for it, like massive integrated multiple sensor installations. <laughs> uh, it's like a huge uh, infrastructure for surveillance. And you're gonna have like uh, cameras with face recognition. You're gonna have uh, devices that can hear audio in the streets and match that with f face recognition. At the same time, the cameras that we already had for some, for a little bit of time with character recognition. And you assemble all that together in a huge infrastructure with high-speed connectivity. Well, that brings some challenges because we have like. Uh, CCTV cameras for quite some time that have been a debate. But what we are seeing right now is that this infrastructure is increasing its capability of uh, all the types of information that you can imagine, not only for chat conversation between people in the streets, face recognition that I could see if you have entered Colombia, have go to JFK, where have you eat last night. So one of the topics that we, uh, we try to bring on the table is that uh, the public authorities need to have this infrastructure. It's, it's something important to keep public security. And, and we, uh, I don't think that anyone would question that. But what we saw as a ground for maybe start a consensus is that you need to have some basic uh, lines where the state should not be able to cross. Because if they do with this kind of infrastructure, you may have some very challenges uh, when we consider like, should the government be able to do this? Should citizens have its own privacy regarding some aspect? So uh, I think this, these new infrastructures, they are already being uh, tested. Uh, we have examples in Brazil, we have examples in Germany, in China, uh, in many countries around the world. But uh, I think we don't have yet a consensus about how can we establish this line? Where is the limit? Where do we are protected more or where do we, like, keep the intimacy of people well protected. Uh, and I think my time is, is almost uh, over or I've overpassed it. But one last thing that uh, it's also very complicated is all these challenges, they face a different uh, perspective when you go to health sector. When we talk about health devices that you can buy like Fitbit or when we consider that public, uh, not only public as we see in Brazil, but the health sector in general, they, they also can benefit a lot with IoT. But, but they specifically have more, in, uh, more implications when you consider not only privacy and security, but also how can you use that information for traditionally uh, like regulatory perspectives. Uh, just to give a, a quick example, and then and people always get scared of it. If insurance companies that you buy for health, for your health, could be able to gather or get information from third-party providers about your health condition, if you're running, if you have alcohol behaviors, or even if we consider like the infrastructure I already mentioned in the public uh, sphere regarding, oh, this, this person have been going to some places dangerous, it lives in dangerous places. If these companies could use this information to like discriminate you, would be in a very complicated position. From the perspective of economic efficiency, it could make sense because the insurance company could definitely like differentiate between risky persons and persons that would probably not pose any risk of uh, bringing more cost to it. But from a social perspective and even more from an ethical perspective, there are challenges, there are increasing challenges. So the insurance sector, especially in, in the health industry, they uh, really would consider using this information and expanding this with IoT. But we must be very careful about how we're going to regulate this because uh, I think the implications, not only economically, but socially, they could be specifically dangerous if we, if we do not like, set a very straight record on it. Uh, I could go on. We have a list of thousands <laughs> of regulatory problems <laughs> that could scare you guys with. But I think that this is the, like the initial landscape. Countries in general, we have seen uh, white papers, studies, policies. They range between these topics. One's specific more in one aspect than the other. Like Brazil, we, we had like this huge section of privacy, not only in smart cities, but privacy in general. In the European context, the telecommunication regulation was something that they, they saw as very problematic. They need to change it a lot of aspect. Uh, but I think these are like the grand, mm -hmm. uh, the grand picture when we consider regulation challenges in mm -hmm. IoT. Thank you, Ramon. That was really great. Uh, <laughs>
so many important and complicated topics that you raise. Uh, I'm going to take this time before we, we still wait like for Professor Troiho to join us and um, take this opportunity to ask you a few questions. Okay. And just for sake this time before we, we still wait like for Professor Troiho to join us and um, take this opportunity to ask you a few questions okay. and just for some brief considerations. So um, I'm very happy with Professor Dasgupta's uh, definition of security versus safety. And when we talk about IoT, we usually talk a lot about cybersecurity, but I've never seen anyone talking about cyber safety. And uh, following your presentation, it seems that uh, cybersecurity would apply for more extreme uh, situations, while the issue of cyber safety would uh, basically uh, lead us to think about a more day-to-day -day basis, uh, ordinary uh, worries that we should have for the function. Right. Is that right. correct? Absolutely. Like, for example, cyber safety, in my mind, is a ransomware. And cyber security will be when U.S. government is hacked for some real money, okay? Mm -hmm. Korea can do that, okay? If they do it, very good. So mm -hmm. that I'll call security. <clears throat> the way that we use this word security basically to scare people. We should have done that in 1984. Orwell said that a long time ago. Why are we are talking about 2018? <laughs> I mean, we didn't listen to anybody. I mean, we didn't follow two mathematicians who are the father of computer science. Goedel said every, every uh, constitution is flawed, right? But we are still talking about regulations. And Turing showed how this uh, misinformation can propagate. Right? We don't teach those things in uh, our schools here. Mm -hmm. But then we put, try to put a band-aid on the cancer. So uh, in some sense, I think the time has come where we have to clean up these uh, wards. And the thing is also there is one thing, so long as there is a profit motivation behind all these public services, mm -hmm. there is no way that we can do it. Now, if I'm... Uh, well, I'm a Columbia professor, uh, but I'm going to make some money someday. I'm going to tell people how to use the flaws in the regulations, okay? So whenever you write a uh, regulation, you hire somebody $100 an hour, hire me for $1,000 an hour, I will show you how to find where the flaws are, okay? <laughs> so that is always going to be. And we have to, like human body, we have to fight the virus all the time. Mm -hmm. There is no end solution. It's an ongoing problem. It's a time-dependent problem. But we have seen some technology which arrests the time-dependent problem, like the blockchain technology. So it looks like that that is a kind of technology where the time steps, you know, like the future, past, and the present mm -hmm. could be very clearly defined. And as a result, you can safeguard a lot of those things. For example, I know uh, the, uh, the health records uh, by one industry in Japan called Karte, K-A-R-T-E. They pronounce it, the German word means Karte, the land Karte, huh? the map. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my colleagues in Finland, they have something called senior tech, senior mm -hmm. T-E-K, you can look. So they are building some housing for the senior people. Okay, now, suppose 10 people get out of the jobs, but people are getting older, so 10 senior people need 10 younger people to take care of them. So. Mm -hmm. This is, this is going to open up the market. It's not going to constrain it under any circumstances. Unfortunately, both Japan and Finland are very expensive places. Mm -hmm. So how we boil it down, that is the case. I think education is the thing. And at a university, uh, outside this patent thing, if like, you know, uh, Dole's proposition of putting patent on university, if they can revoke that, everything that knowledge that we produce is open domain, okay? Then that's a better solution than trying the, sorry, the dean telling me that did you patent your idea? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so if that is gone, I think then the education is really opening up this can of worms. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand, again, that regulation is all, always on the boundary of inside, where the activation is. 
So again, going back to Turing, Turing said activation or in, inside thing is created by God, and the boundary data is created by the devil. <laughs> so this is, this is not going to change. Mm -hmm. So with this thing in mind, we have to evolve. We cannot have a stagnated idea. We cannot yeah. think regulations in terms of, you know, that what it was like my grandfather's time. Mm -hmm. Things have changed, or we will change. And I think this computer technology will allow us to change. Mm -hmm. That's very good, Professor. Uh, this is, I think, like one of the key debates that we are having. And uh, because Brazil is only doing this thinking about IoT now, uh, one of the goals of the project is actually to learn with past mistakes and try somehow not to repeat them. So for instance, uh, regarding the issue of uh, connected devices, uh, one of the, 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 the ideas that permeates the study is basically uh, to build contexts of safety. And one of the ways to achieve that is, for instance, we assimilated uh, a work that was done by Mozilla, uh, the Mozilla right. Foundation, uh, in regards with what they call trust marks for IoT. Yeah. So basically what they built was a framework of a visually identifiable signs that can actually tell you as a consumer or even a, as a, an acquirer of those devices what that device actually is capable to do. And uh, I would love to ask Ramon, for instance, to talk a little bit more about these trust marks and also, for instance, how do you see uh, these issues of cybersecurity being addressed uh, in the, the IoT plan? And uh, what do you think Brazil can do differently in order not to fall into this uh, dilemma that Professor Das Gupta basically raised to us? Oh, yeah. That, that's a very good point. And um, one of the things, and I think the Mozilla, the project that they, they call like the trust marks for IoT, one of the things they are trying to achieve and that we didn't do for many times, and in privacy we have that with the long privacy policies that almost nobody reads, is that you need to make, uh, as we are facing a challenge now, because all these devices will be connected, all these devices will have specific conditions that the consumers need to have at least some awareness. We are once again trying to make uh, alternatives to this long term. So the, the user will not read this. The, the, the user barely uh, reads manuals. So they will definitely not read like one other piece of paper that's called sec information security uh, guidelines. They, they will not read that. So the, the thing that Mozilla pro, uh, was trying to promote, and one of the things that we mentioned in the study as one of the possibilities for the industry in like a self-regulation uh, that could happen in the form of voluntary certification of devices, that the industry could, could settle this up, could use these standards that and this could be developed together with social uh, of the uh, of society, of academia, in order for you to make this the better way possible for consumers to have a glimpse of categories like this device is better for this. One of the things uh, we like made an, an analogy in Brazil is that we developed some time ago uh, some form of visualization of an energy consumption. So once the user goes to store to buy some electronic, he can have this. Uh, this stamp that's going to tell him, oh, this device will consume more energy, it's like graded A, B, C in energy efficiency. So we, we, we saw this project Mozilla and we think, yes, th that could be something that the industry could achieve, uh, at, at least at first, before we can have this co-regulation regime that could work together with the industry, but for you to make a distinction of your project. So the, the consumer would have more awareness of what is going on with its device uh, and at the same time you could like differentiate devices that have some quality some standards of security and others that don't have this is not perfect we it definitely should not be like the the bullet uh, the the silver bullet yeah. to solve this topic but it's one of the things that it could be done to in order to uh, for increasing information security awareness of consumers in this new era. Uh, other things that we try to, uh, to analyze, uh, 
besides critical infrastructure, that one of the topics, and Thomas already mentioned it when, in, in its question, uh, we saw it in Europe as well. Uh, critical infrastructure is something that governments are already considering for a long time because they are aware that hacks in these kinds of infrastructure could be de could be devastating uh, for public, uh, public sector in general. Uh, but aside from it, we have a debate about how can you, and not only in the public sector, but how can you coordinate this in nationwide with the private sector, with academia, with researchers, how can you make a bridge between all these, uh, these parties? Uh, we know uh, for, for quite a long time that we have these experts in, in computer science that test all the time in, in cybersecurity as well. They test the system, they test uh, devices, but information uh, does not flow easily between these experts, the consumers, the industry. So one of the things that we considered was very important to do is cooperation. You need to have some kind of uh, institutional design to make this cooperation works in a sense, especially for information flow. Because if you have information about vulnerabilities between these players, consumers may not all the time use this information because they uh, either lack the time or lack the knowledge, but if you make this information available, a lot of parties could influence the debate, could uh, try to push, push oh, this, this product is not good, it's vulnerable, so you can have more people aware of the situation and mm -hmm. things could go better, is one of, the, one of the things that you could do as well. Another topic is you could develop uh, internally in a country one, inst uh, one institution or a group of institutions that could coordinate among the public sector the challenges of information security. Uh, we saw this in Brazil. We have one specific in institution that nowadays uh, among the federal government tries to, to do this, but it's not yet, yet developed and it's not open to public uh, opinions, to academia, experts. It's very strict. Uh, close in its own. So one of the things we also uh, think could be very helpful, not only Brazilian uh, reality, but in, in other countries as well, is for you to push forward to develop these institutions for and to coordinate among all the public sector. Because uh, you could gain in efficiency, you could also gain in coordination, because if you find some very specific vulnerability in one of the softwares that the government is using, you could spread this information throughout the whole network, so all the other branches of government, not only federal, but state and municipal one, could be protected against it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we have many options that should be put forward together. There is no silver bullet here. Uh, and you could even consider other options. Uh, we saw in the US uh, some bipartisan movement for I an IoT pro uh, bill of law that would stricken regulation in, in security. Uh, the private sector that we talked about, they were very scared of it. But it's, it's a proposal that is also on the table. But mm -hmm. uh, I think you, when you consider cybersecurity in IoT, the most important thing is that you should attack in different perspectives. There is no single solution to this problem uh, besides this coordinated action in multiple uh, projects at once. That's great. Uh, let me change gears a little bit and raise another topic that I think is important, which is data collection on the part of the public sector. So we've had uh, some interesting cases in Brazil, for instance, in the city of Sao Paulo, in which um, the city has a very interesting bus transportation system in which all uh, transportation cards are basically digital. And of course, by doing that, you can collect passenger data where they take the bus, where they uh, leave the bus, and other information as well. It also comes now with a facial recognition system, especially to identify if the person is entitled or not to a special fare, like the elderly or students. So uh, that's the situation right now. One of the proposals of the City Hall in Sao Paulo uh, was recently to privatize that data and basically sell it uh, to companies that would monetize that data. And of course, that caused a lot of uh, controversy, especially because of the issue of consent. So if you take the bus every day, it's very hard uh, not to give consent because you simply do not have the option of saying, well, I don't want my data to be collected, so I'm not going to take the bus anymore. And like uh, for the millions of people that live in Sao Paulo, they need to take the bus because they need to get somewhere. So uh, in this context, uh, one of the ideas that was part of this report uh, was basically that 
uh, the model of consent might be uh, flawed for the public sector in many cases, because if you are a public uh, uh, official or a city or trying to do a better service, you will need data to do that. Uh, so like Bloomberg used to say here in New York, you cannot, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. And uh, the public administration definitely can make good use of data. But what should be the limits for the use of that data? And one of the ideas that came up in this study is precisely the idea of purpose. So if you are taking the bus and you're collecting data from buses, you probably should use that data to improve uh, the transportation system, and that would be your uh, natural expectation as a user, and not use that data in order to receive advertisement from third parties or even uh, for the police to chase you uh, if you are a fugitive, unless you get a court order. If you get a court order, that's fine, but uh, to let the police immediately connect to the data transportation system from the buses, it seems a little bit out of purpose in this particular debate. So my question to you is, how do you see the limits of data collection uh, in the public system? Uh, is this a, a, a cybersecurity issue maybe? And uh, with that said, uh, how can we approach uh, this idea of purpose, and maybe it can be helpful in the public uh, sector as well. So if you have comments on that. Well, one small comment. Learning from past mistake is very old. It's called Bayesian. 19, 1761, Thomas Bayes died. And I just, for education and purposes, I will ask, anybody learning Bayesian here? Hmm. Anybody learning Bayesian in computer science? A little bit. Any, well, anybody learning the second uh, extreme things, which says how the terrorism has to be modeled? Mm -hmm. So if I'm working for this uh, uh, public transportation thing, as I told Professor Greenfield, he was the devil's advocate and I'm the uh, devil, I will work for the taxi company to figure out where to disrupt the uh, transportation so that I can maximize my profit. Mm -hmm. So that is the kind of technology and other things will always become, unless you say that we are going to erase that after some time, mm -hmm. or encrypt it in such a way that other people cannot use it. So if we are even trying to find out that whether it is uh, profitable or how we can improve, I think there are other metrics, other ways of doing it, which cannot be exploited by anything, anybody else, completely anonymous. So they won't, won't even know who is coming up, what. But if you are taking a bus from one area, statistically, you can attach that, uh, what is the socioeconomic condition of that. That's how the Congress did the gerrymandering. Yes. So, so the thing is to minimize that. You, know, you cannot really have a foolproof way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, erasing the data or collecting the data with only that kind of part, yes, there are ways of doing it. But that goes in, uh, mainly you have to put some kind of different kind of paradigm into that, what uh, we call a live design kind of thing, meaning that the design is not over when the building is built. Mm -hmm. So live design starts when the people start coming into the thing. Mm -hmm. So it is the use of the people which yeah. makes the design as opposed to the civil engineering design. After the building is done, yes. I get paid, I go home. No, but the, actually this design starts when the people start using it. So. These, these questions are there, but there are some, I think, basic mathematical elements which are missing. That how to model it. It has to be modeled with uncertainty. What kind of uncertainty? It is the extreme statistics that we have to use, not the bell curve. We have to use the Bayesian kind of ideas that we learned from the past. We have to use the game theory because it, I do not want to call uh, the big uh, corporations terrorists, but they have the same signature, though. I mean, mathematically, if you take that, you cannot distinguish. Mm -hmm. So I'm not call, calling uh, you know, Citibank as a terrorist. <laughs> but a mathematical signature is the same. So that going back to that, you can see that what are the intent of those things. Mm -hmm. and, you, and good thing in mathematics is that there are only three kinds of extreme that can happen, mm -hmm. not four. You cannot, I mean, it's proven. Natural, industrial, and, and what we call the terrorism. Okay, that means intentional. Mm -hmm. Industrial 
is also man-made but not intentional. Mm -hmm. Natural we do not have. So these are the three different, very different kind of things. Mm -hmm. And again, I must say, it started, all started in Colombia. Yes, our professor was Professor Gumbel. Right. Mm -hmm. Professor Gumbel, you can check, he was the man who started that in Nigerian school. So the first distribution, which is called the natural disaster distribution, is also called Gumbel distribution. Hmm. So now we are, when we are talking about this kind of thing, it is the fresh air, the second kind. That means how do you detect uh, intentional damage, not the other kind of damage. Uh, if I take 30 seconds, if you don't mind. Sure, so if please. industrial, I would say that when I buy a car, it is designed for 90,000 miles. So they do the statistics, how the car is going to fail before 90,000 miles. After that, they don't worry. Mm -hmm. but, the, uh, but the terrorist or the man-made one is just the other way around. Unless 100 people die, it's not a terrorism. It starts. Mm -hmm. So it can go open-ended. So one is closed-ended, one is open-ended. And the mathematics are different for that. Mm -hmm. So when we... When we simulate them, see, that's where I think the computer power comes. That we can simulate those things, all the bad things that can happen, all the things which can go wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. Like uh, we can simulate, is there a chance a president in the U.S. will badmouth the CIA and things? Mm -hmm. Well, no, it that cannot happen. But the computer might pop up. Mm -hmm. So those kind of simulations are possible. Mm -hmm. And those, for those kind of simulations, we do not need random number generator like the one that we say they are extreme number generators. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will say that this kind of awareness will also push our engineering, our technology. Being a civil engineer, I would like to go from building a house to you know, making the house habitable, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So all these things go in together, yes. And educationally, I think we need a revamp of that. Mm -hmm. We have to do, um, I mean, security engineering or security sciences as a part of engineering, yeah. not the safety engineering. See, yeah. mm -hmm. So whatever we say, it's all safety engineering. But from that, we have to move to security engineering. Mm -hmm. And all these ingredients will come, and all these are very good examples. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic examples that we learn from the physical world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. This is great, especially because we are on the verge of debating the policy implications of self-driving cars. Right. And uh, basically, there's a famous example about this uh, of Mercedes-Benz basically announcing that their self-driving car will uh, take as a priority the protection of the driver uh, in detriment of the protection of everyone else uh, in the surroundings. So basically, if a crash is inevitable, the car will do the maneuvers that are necessary to protect whoever is inside, even if in the outside there like, there's like 20 or 50 people. And uh, the question here is, would you buy a car that would do otherwise, like an altruistic car <laughs> that would basically protect the uh, lives of uh, many uh, in the outside and not the ones in the inside? So that's the type of question we will have to translate into code. So I'm, I really well, appreciate. We say that you know, like uh, when we design a, 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 a railway engine, right? Well, it is hitting a b building. If we make the building stronger, we kill more people in the train. Or if we make the train yeah. stronger, we kill more people in the uh, building. So it is a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to how do we cut the baby? Yes. Which, which, this this yes. is the old question. How do we yeah. <laughs> dissect the baby? Which ma parts? makes us reveal all the, the, the theories on morality and like utilitarianism and so on. So that's very Why? interesting. I'm very happy that Professor Marcos Troijo uh, could join us. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you. So uh, in the interest of time, once again, I would like you to make a few comments. Sure. Uh, and we are going to wrap up... Uh, in a few minutes, but you still have like, a, I would say, six minutes to, to right. give us uh, your uh, comments on the subject. And I will save the last few minutes in order to get questions. I see already some hands raised, but uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. Please forgive me for being so late. Blame it on the finance minister of Brazil. This is the day where you have the Brazil summit in New York. So the, the, the beau monde of, of Brazil was over there. Marcio Fortes was with me at the, at the Harvard Club. Uh, so please forgive me for, for being so late married. Thank you so much. My pleasure uh, to be here and, and colleagues. Ronaldo had asked me to 
say a few words, uh, not necessarily directed to the Internet of Things, but to the uh, role technology play, the role of technology in Brazil and, and China's uh, bigger picture strategy, right? And I, as I was, uh, I was in, I was in a cab uh, coming up here. I was remembering that in 1996, I, I, I was a diplomat. I was supposed to participate at a conference in South Africa, or the Information Society and Development Conference. So there are two great things about this conference. One, it was hosted by Nelson Mandela, and two, we had the opportunity to interact with the head of the American delegation. It was an economy that goes by the name of Joseph Stiglitz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember putting together some research at the time on the overall R&D investment uh, of Brazil and China. And the, 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 the scope that I took on out was that from 1978 all the way to 1996, Brazil have, had moved from 0.5% of its GDP going to R&D to 1% of R&D. In China, 1978, right, the uh, year of uh, of the so-called opening up, R&D spending had moved, had moved from 0.2% of GDP to 0.4% of GDP. Well, if you, if you take a time machine and come all the way to the 23rd of, 23rd of April 2018, Brazil is still spending the same 1%, the very same 1% of its GDP in research, development, and innovation, where China is at 2.2 and moving in very strongly to 2.5%, which is the overall uh, average OECD countries spend in research, development, and innovation. Well, you can say, well, this is, of course, the, uh, the child of, of, of China's famous uh, capacity to plan and to strategize. And I agree. But I think there's something else there that, is re that it relates to both the industrial policy models and the trade strategies adopted that explain it more than simply uh, a decision on the part of the leadership to invest more in research, development, and innovation. And, it, and it's basically the fact that both Brazil and China for the past 40 years have tried to implement some sort of creative adaptation policies, looking at the core producers of technology in the world and trying to emulate them. The main difference, I think, is that whereas Brazil tried to do that within an environment that favors import substitution industrialization, which basically, which basically, basically argues that, of course, we are going to be able to produce the technology ourselves, but we'll do so in an environment that is insulated from the rest of the world. China pursued creative adaptation, creative adaptation with a view to conquer foreign markets, right? So is, of course, we want to industrialize. It's creative adaptation, but we are doing so in order to be able to compete with the most important markets of the world. So the creative adaptation that we saw in China had a lot to do with producing the same as, what, as, as the leader. So we have the technology number one. Let us clone, let us copy, let us, let us learn from that, but let us, this is our reference, this is what we have to produce, we have to do the same, but at, at a cheaper cost. Whereas Brazil was just, let's do something different. Right? Let, let, us, let, us, let us do the very same thing. Costs are not very important because the domestic market is protected. And my impression, Ronaldo, is that this trading nation strategy that unites both the industrial and trade policy realms of, of China actually allowed China to generate the necessary resources to achieve the scale of investment R&D that you see today. Whereas in Brazil, we did not have the same thing. It also allowed for another major difference that is a structure between the way Brazil and, and China approach the issue of, of, of technology. In China today, 75% of R&D is coming from enterprises. 25% a combination of government expenditure plus universities, colleges, centers for research that are in the hands of government. Within Brazil, it's exactly the opposite. And Brazil is not a communist country, right? So 75% of R&D investment is coming from government, 25% from companies. And half of the 25% that's coming from companies is coming still from Petrobras, which is a state-owned enterprise, right? So the, the transmission channels there between the lab and the market and the generation of intellectual property rights not very strong. Of course, Brazil is still trying, still coping with creative adaptation. China has moved 
on strongly to creative destruction, our old parameters given by Joseph Schimpeter. As you know, I probably, I'm sure that you probably discussed this earlier today, China is already number two in terms of depositing patents at the intellectual property uh, uh, rights uh, organization in, in Switzerland. And where I dis when I see this moving uh, very quickly in areas that, that, that are related to the Internet of Things, which is a pretty big umbrella, you can put a lot of things underneath, is in how you use AI to model trade negotiations. By the way, well, now this is this is the project, one yes. of the initiatives that I'm leading now. It's called the, Intel, in, the Intelligent Tech and Trade Initiative, because today, um, augmented intelligence already can give trade negotiators access to data banks and to other sources of information that will better subsidize the way uh, negotiators sit at at a trade roundtable. Uh, it's very interesting how China is a leader in that regard. And also, according to this work that we're doing now, how China is using AI to project the different possible outcomes of a specific trade negotiation. Say, if you, if, if you give away on tariffs here, if you open quote, quotes at, at another product, what are the longer term effects? So this capacity of China to lead in areas that are not so obvious, so we're not only talking about solar energy, wind energy, uh, high-tech uh, uh, railways, we're talking also about augmented intelligence and applied to something that the Chinese traditionally do very well, which is trade, will be another very important uh, difference in, in the years to come. Um, I think we have to really focus on the case of Brazil because it's one of the most important examples of how creativity, creativity is not enough. There's something else that must bridge the gap between that, that camp and the camp of, of technology. Whereas the Chinese, perhaps, the, the overall stock of creativity was not that dense, but because of strategy, because of the right policies, because of the marriage between industrial trade policy and, and technology strategy, China today is in a much, uh, is in a much better position. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. That was great. Uh, we have a uh, quick... Six minutes? Uh, so let's take the two questions that I see. So, yes, Rodrigo. Hi. Hi again. I'd like to understand uh, in the point of the governments having access to private data. Why is it so difficult for governments to study, to study and to decide on this matter if private companies are already benefiting from this. And I have two data points that are interesting. So last year, uh, California police subpoenaed Amazon to get access to microphone data from, M from Alexa. Yeah. And they are already using this to store and to understand words to sell better adverta advertisement for their customers. And on the other hand, a University of Chicago undergraduate published uh, just last month a study from the taxi cabs from New York and the minutes of the Fed and found correlation between uh, taxi drivers going through Fed and banks, those the, the big banks prior to the minutes of the Fed and post-Fed to understand uh, interest rates. So if, if this is not for the public, uh, safety and security, so what's the point of not sharing this data? Very good. Uh, let me get the one final question. Uh, so, Thomas. Uh, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, thank you all, again, for some great presentations. Uh, my question is around uh, regulatory challenges, um, and there were some, some great points that were made here, but I suppose my my main question is, uh, as IoT develops so, so quickly, the technologies and the products, um, that puts a real strain on government's ability to effectively regulate them. Um, and so I wonder if you had any thoughts about, instead of strict regulations, what incentives you think governments are capable of or ought to use in order, you know, primarily, uh, from my perspective, to increase the security of IoT devices um, in, instead of just outright regulating them? That's good. Let's take one final question, and I will ask the panelists to use these questions as a wrap-up. So, Rodrigo, can you help me with the microphone, please? Where's it going? Just in the back, please. Oh, you're right. Oh, you've got the internet quiz, huh? Yeah. Internet and things. 
Uh, two, two quick questions. One is, a lot of the products we already have are being manufactured in China. So I'm wondering whether China will just automatically put this, the, this type of tracking technology in the products that they manufacture, or whether they will um, you know, allow companies that are foreign companies to ask for it to be embedded before, before implanting it. And also, my second point is that we already have this technology all throughout the US. We have smart homes all of being built all over the US. We have a lot of implanted technologies such as heart monitors, baby monitors, diabetes monitors that already have this type of tracking technology in it. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me, you know, should we be looking at individual countries formulating their own policies when this technology is, has already blanketed the globe? Or should we be looking at more of a global solution as opposed to the Chinese solution and the Brazilian solution when the products are, you know, we, you know, we, we all use each other's products. So it's almost impossible to have a, a, glo a, a Brazilian solution or a Chinese solution that doesn't influence other countries. Yeah, totally no. right. So thank you for the questions. Uh, let me handle to the panelists. And let's use these answers as a wrap up, please. Okay. I don't think I can. I'm confident, except I just learned you call it internet quizzer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You learned the Portuguese version for Internet of Things. That's good. That's good. Hamo. Oh, uh, okay, so uh, let me start with uh, your question. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, well, uh, the example you gave about Alexa, uh, it, it's, it's very important for two perspectives. One, the consumer protection of privacy. And if I'm not wrong, Amazon were ready to fight in court, but then the subject like accepted to give to the police its audio. But in, in thesis, Amazon would go to the end of, of the court system to protect its user privacy on that topic. And, and it's very important because otherwise you could send the wrong message to the consumer. So you, um, Alexa would, would give me away to the cops. That would be a very complicated public, public uh, relationship, uh, public uh, PR message. Uh, but yeah, w w one of the things that we, we saw is that there are two, uh, uh, when you consider the public sector, what are they thinking? They, they can use this, this data and it's very, uh, it's impressive what can achieve when they use the data to maximize efficiency. In Sao Paulo, we have the example with uh, transportation apps like Uber, uh, Lyft and others uh, where the Sao Paulo was the, like the first city to, in Brazil to propose to regulate this, uh, this new ecosystem. And one of the things that it did, but it's still fighting the right way to do, legally the right way to do, is to have, uh, okay, you can operate, you can operate under these rules, you pay this tax, and you give me data in order for me to make the public uh, transportation system better. So, and this data can and can uh, assure that the gov that the city uh, the city hall has lots of information about where is the traffic jams, what can I do to make it fl to going to go better. I think this is a reality. In uh, in in general, we have these public authorities thinking about that. But one of the challenges we see is that there are no not many guidelines yet. At least in Brazil, one of the challenges we see is that there are not guidelines. Uh, posted for the public authorities to use this data in a way that they are compliant with the rules. Uh, we recall in the, uh, in the, during the study one, one, many, one member of the Ministry of Health stating that, you know, you guys need needs to settle this up, make me a comprehensive framework for privacy and include me with guidelines, because right now we have a lot of data, but we are afraid to use it. We just saw the UK example where they did some things with health data and there was an entire commission because there was some flaws on it. So we, we are afraid that right now we don't have strictly saying like the guidelines for what I can do, what I cannot do. So if I do anything outside what I'm not sure we, it is the law binding me, I'm going to be prosecuted later. So I think the public sector in some countries, uh, I could say this by Brazil, they have data sometimes, sometimes they don't, but the technology is there and they can use it. But in other instances, the data is there, but they are afraid to use it because they are not, uh, it's not clear where the boundaries are that they can use that data. So uh, in order to avoid prosecution, they would not do anything that could be dangerous. That is one of the, one of the thoughts. Uh, 
about your your comments, Thomas, on the on the al alternatives that we can do for that. Alter strict regulation could be very dangerous to cure innovation, but what can we do? Uh, we saw some very uh, clever ideas along the along the road in the study. One of the things, and and that is very connected to what you just mentioned, the 75% uh, in the financing projects that you could have the public. Uh, so public money flowing to this new development of startups and IoT projects, you should have specific requirements for safety and security. So you would like mandate, okay, you want to receive public fundings, mm -hmm. that's fair enough, but you need to have a security by design model. So if you don't comply with that, you won't receive the public funding. That's one, one way to think on the, on the problem. Another way, and that was at the beginning of the study, somebody thought, okay, we give like tax breaks for companies that go green go green on on uh, on other th on other things we not only energy consumption but at the same time gas pollution so if we give tax breaks for this why not give tax breaks for companies that develop devices that are secure that are private compliant pri privacy compliant so at least we saw these two alternative these two like uh, not generally used ways to think about this issue but could be used you could either think of financing projects in this way or giving tax breaks. Two alternatives. I have a very short question. Is it possible, um, again, very stupid question could be, that no, no, no. the volume of data that you are allowed to sell, right, you have to put that in the public domain and then put a software that I can erase my thing with the thing that the companies can get only the updated one. They cannot go back. So that way, you have collected my data okay. and you want to buy? Okay, why? But this is available in the open. In the public, I can yeah. go and correct it, and but you cannot go back to that, huh? Mm -hmm. Then why about not giving a tax break for people like me to go to gym? It's good for my health, right? <laughs> that will cut down the health cost. No, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I think at one point the ideas that you could develop, the design that you can make to like foster security innovation instead of going to the traditional like strong regulation that could, would probably kill innovation in some sense. Uh, we even ask some uh, information security guys that, okay, so we're going to mandate this type of requirement. And they were all scary because they said, okay, but this kind of security requirement may works for this device in this specific project of civil, uh, civil engineering. But if you take the same device, it could be used also in a health uh, infrastructure. But uh, when we are considering like hospitals and this stuff, the same device should have completely different levels of security. See, that's why the policy comes in as a property. See, the policy should be one of the parameters in the design. Yeah. And it is possible to digitize the policy. That's what I'm saying. That's with the fuzzy right. logic, mm. with the compet competition with words, you can digitize the policy and you can compare. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That's a great point, especially if you think about this concept of privacy by design. So design embedding the policy and also strategies like uh, differential privacy for maintaining databases. I think that's a, a very solid approach. So in the plan, we, in the study, we try to approach uh, these avenues as well. So it's not only about regulation, but it's also how do we embed policy decisions right. in the code that and in the architecture. That is quite simple. That is yes. Professor Zade. Columbia professor has done that, and I think uh, Benku is working on this blockchain That's kind great. of technology to, to to obliterate the past data yes. and work only on the future one, mm -hmm. yeah. so that uh, all these things are open. You can go, you can change your, you can withdraw your things. So that part of the data will not be uh, usable for others, or if they use it, That's that would be a prosecution. Yeah. This is one of the most promising approaches, in my view. And I think great. it will cost, what, two, yeah. three graduate students to write that program for a yeah. month? Yeah. That's no, great. And I think that one of, the, one of the very important things that we saw is that uh, you need to have policy, you need to have uh, debates and regulation, but this needs to be spe specifically tied to the technological side because all the solutions... It's specified, yeah, specification. They, they need to be developed well, together. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, well, maybe that I, since I don't understand the intricacy, uh, to translate that into grammar, you know, we have a grammarian sitting here, Professor Doherty. He was the chairman of linguistics department in mm -hmm. NYU, mm -hmm. MIT electrical engineer. How, <laughs> how odd can you get, right? So maybe there are some ways to circumvent that. One of the biggest security problems is not signing anything. 
but I have seen and was told by my professors at MIT, Noam Chomsky and others, never to even look at this and do it. But there are machines that can listen to the telephone and say, who is this? And identify the voice and write where you are. And yeah. it's just like that crazy set of movies, The Matrix, that come and get you. Uh, I'm glad you asked that, and that relates to your question right. there as well, because that's exactly what we are going through. So we are deploying these devices right now without asking the questions in regards of their full implication for our lives and what they mean. And I think we are already seeing some collateral effects. So the aforementioned botnets uh, that are, you know, devices that have been captured by uh, a centralized group and are, be a, are able basically to attack uh, critical resources in a certain country. That is one type of uh, policy repercussions we are having. But that is just to, to emphasize and uh, see that uh, the, the work that Brazil is doing and that China is doing, I think is extremely important because uh, there are no ready-made solutions. We are probably going to have to fix the car while the car is moving, because the car has already been moving for some time, and uh, the car has a lot of problems. So I think that's one of the reasons we are here. Marcus, your final comments, please. No, yeah, it's just that I'm, I'm very interested in the perception that uh, regulations are important, uh, but uh, many of these problems are international in nature. Yes. Right? So Which, we said, have yeah. to avoid what would be the inertial course of things, which is a clash of legislations mm -hmm. impeding the technology, uh, keeping the technology from, from advancing. Uh, in the 1990s, I was a delegate to the United Nations uh, Commission on International Trade Law. Mm -hmm. And back then, we worked on the so-called model law for electronic trade, the model law for e electronic signatures. And, and it was beautiful because... It was pretty much the same legislation. So not only the technology, but the legislation itself would be in communications at creating uh, what you know desired international harmony in that particular regard. So the same way we talk about curators uh, as as important elements in teaching the technology the rights and wrongs, we, we should we should add the same approach oh, to to legislators as well. Yes. So uh, let me conclude in the, uh, this great panel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having in my mind uh, Professor Ku's intervention about the values that must be embedded uh, in these devices, because most likely our lives uh, are going to be surrounded by them and in a certain way directed by them as well. So we better have like a very careful consideration of what values are we actually including in these devices because they will materialize themselves in the forms that we live. And I think this is actually very important. With that, I would like to ask you to help me thank our panelists. This was really great. Thank you. <laughs>